I cannot explain how hard the jungle is physically. If you imagine being at your absolute limit every single day, you're in there basically for four weeks solid. Four weeks in the same clothes, no washing, everything looks the same. It is so hard, so hard to navigate in the jungle. No one thinks it was a success. Afghan was a massive failure. Why was it a massive failure? Taliban took back control within yeah. a matter of months yeah. after years and years of spending billions. Yeah. How can you not say that that isn't a failure? Imagine every day for six months, you are essentially going, I might walk out and lose my limbs or get blown up, like every day. Imagine the mental toll mm. on that, like I'm gonna walk out and I don't know if the next step I take, that's me, gone. Jeffers, welcome to the show, mate. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, very much. Uh, I'm intrigued about this one, your journey and your path that you've been on. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to roll all the way back. Um, yep. Where did you grow up and how did you get into the special forces? I grew up in rural Worcestershire. So small farm. Um, my parents had a small dairy farm. Pretty normal upbringing. Definitely very much centred around the outdoors. So spent basically my childhood out hunting, fishing, camping, um, sport, played a lot of rugby. And then, and I always, and I cannot tell you exactly where it came from, but from 11 years old, maybe even younger, I knew that all I wanted to do was join the military. Whether that's watching, it's probably a combination of growing up in the outdoors, loving adventure, and honestly, probably watching too many 80s action films, like mm. sneaking down, watching Terminator, Commando, mm. uh, Rambo. <laughs> Um, so I knew that was my path. That's all I ever wanted to do. School, college, travelled, lived in New Zealand, lived in Canada, um, just like cleaning rooms, doing outdoor stuff. And then came back and joined the Marines in 2008. So went through basic training in 2008. How old, how old were you when 24. you joined? 24. So it was a little bit older. Mm. And was that a positive for you, do you think, being that age, a little bit older yeah. rather than 18, 19? Yeah. yeah. I, I take my hat off to anyone that goes into the forces, 16, 17, 18. I think because you're immersed straight away, you know, shock of capture into a completely different world. Whereas having a bit of experience, life experience, having done other things, I would say definitely stood me in good stead going mm. in a little bit older. I think that was probably, I think between 22, 24 is almost an ideal age because you've got some life experience, yeah. but you're still young enough to yeah. take the battering on your body, which gets harder the older mm. you get. And did you have to apply? How does it work? Did you go in and apply and say, right, I want to get involved in this? Or did you have someone who said, oh, there's a, I'll open a door for you? Or Do you know what? Funny. So you, you just go through the application process. I'd always said I was going to apply and go in as an officer. And the very first thing that you have to do is a psychometric test in the careers office. And I am really fucking bad at maths. <laughs> <laughs> and I completely, I failed the maths. I came back and I failed the maths section. And in that moment, it was almost when you've been driving to something for years and years, mm. and they're like, you failed the maths section. You can either wait six months and apply again, or you can just join as a recruit, as a bod. Mm. I was like, I'll just join. Yeah. And honestly, that chain, that sort of crossroads, once I'd been in and the experiences that I've had, that's the best thing that ever happened to mm. me. And I'm sure, you know, you don't know the difference officers who go in and do it, have great experiences. But to me, from what I saw, you get a lot more opportunities or different jobs open up yeah. to you being just a body, I guess, just a soldier. So I didn't know that. Officer. So basically you could go in and apply and go straight for an officer if you pass some exams. So you go, so yeah, there's two paths. So officers, generally, you can become, once you, so say you can go through the military, get to a certain rank, and then do late entry. It's called LE, yeah. late entry officer. But generally, officers will go, officers will join as officers, and soldiers will join as soldiers. Mm. And it's just a different, it's still, you know, arduous training. They just have the extra leadership or officer component. Mm. Pros and cons with it. There's more pay up front. The probably con is for a lot of officers, 
maybe your first couple of years you get to do boots on the ground stuff but then you're transitioning more to planning more desk based mm. type of roles mm. unless you're very good at managing your career and that just never interested mm. so when you look back do you think that was a good move for you going straight in at the bottom yeah absolutely yeah, okay and tell me your sort of day to day when you went in there were they like screaming and shouting at you to do certain stuff and training hard what what was it was it was there bullying in there back then what? no to i'd say when i went in 2008 i would i would almost say that it was a good mix at that point you know stories from back in the 80s mm. i think yeah, it was harsh and there probably was more of that bullying culture if you go on the stories that mm. you're told i think now and again this is anecdotal but speaking to people on training teams it's gone too far the other way yeah. it's gone a bit too soft in what they're restricted on doing i think when i was there seemed like a pretty good balance like mm. it was fucking hard but it didn't i never witnessed bullying like there was no bullying yeah. it, and he didn't need it like it was hard enough mm. if you weren't good enough or suitable you weren't going to make it through mm. and it is less about the shouting and it's less about the physical when people think about the military what they think is the hard physical things mm. so you know, commando training, the commando tests at the end, the 30 miler or the bottom field thrashings. Yes, they are hard. But what breaks most people is if you imagine for eight months when you go into Limpston, Royal Marine Recruit Training for eight months, every single day, you're just waiting to get thrashed for something like you, you're just at their kind of mercy the whole mm. time. And things like end of the day, you're already knackered from whatever you've been doing. Someone's messed up. They get the entire troop, so 30 guys, to empty everything in their lockers over the balcony. So you've got 30 guys, multiple, all of their kit. And then they just cover it in mud and water, mix it all up. And it's like, right, see you in the morning, 5 a.m. for a full inspection. And then you spend all <laughs> night, what, you're basically a laundromat. You're yeah. washing, ironing, folding. That's what breaks people. Mm. It's 3 a.m. polishing boot pipes in the toilets yeah. to make them shiny. Like that's the shit that breaks people. It's not the physical stuff. It's getting people tired, doing boring tasks, get them wet and cold. That is what breaks people. Did you know before you went in there that you were mentally tough? Or did you have to find out? I think so mental toughness is basically your ability to cope with discomfort. And so people talk about mental toughness and we associate it with certain things. Mm. So again, you talk about the military, people assume that if you've been in the military, you're mentally tough, which is true in that narrow spectrum. So example is, and you could apply this to business, sports, whatever it is, you are very good in on operations, on jobs within that role, but then the rest of the life is falling apart, crap relationships, things are going wrong. They haven't got that mental toughness across all aspects. Yeah. So mental toughness could be having difficult conversations with your wife or partner to mm. get through a tough batch instead of shying away from yeah. it. So it comes in all okay. of that. Yeah. And I think true mental toughness is is less about, the reason I got through that course, the reason I got through special forces is because it meant so much to me. I had a deep desire to get through it and it aligned with who I was as a person. Like I saw myself as a soldier. And so when you have that, like you'd have seen it in a bit, you know, you're very successful as a business person you will have been through some fucking yeah. hard times to do <laughs> that. Right, and yeah. the only reason you can get through that and say that you're mentally tough in that aspect is because you believed in it. You yeah. believed in yourself and you believed in what you're doing. Yeah. And that's the only way you get through it. Mm. So it's you, that mental toughness comes when you are following something that you really believe in yeah. and you're passionate about yeah. because then you can withstand that hardship. Mm. So I think that's, I think, to a degree in physical sense, because I'd already, you know, playing rugby, things like that mm. set you up well for cult. You can cultivate all of these skills, but to an, to an extent, so much of it comes from that internal, like what are you willing to do to get to where you want to yeah. be in whatever yeah. it is? Yeah. Just rolling back there, you said you were training, you went into the Royal Marines, mm. you were training for eight months. The eight months was to get into what? Just the Royal Marines. Just so, the, okay. So Royal Marines Commando, same as Parachute Regiment. That's the longest basic training in okay. the world. So you were you you went in as a Royal Marine. Yeah. And you wanted to become a Royal Marine Commando. No, you. So you go it. So Royal Marines Commando is it's the same thing. Like Royal Marines, yep. Royal Marines. Basically, it's split into two phases. The basic training is fifteen weeks. 
that's essentially the Royal Marines training. And then they, I think this is the way it is, the, the commando training is the last portion, the commando tests. But right. anyone who goes through, that's essentially what you become. Mm. And then after that, you apply for special forces if that's a route that yeah. you want to go down. Okay. So the special forces is the creme de la creme. Yes. Yeah. And did you, how long were you in the Royal Marines before you, you, you thought, you know what, I want to push boundaries again. I want to go to the Champions League of... Of, of this and hit the special forces i did a year as a general marine and then i did a selection to be i always wanted to apply and try special forces i didn't feel like i had enough experience at that point so i did a year as a general marine and then i did a selection for special forces communicator so you're still a raw marine but yeah. you go through a six month selection to then work with special forces so yeah. you're attached to a special forces squadron providing like the signal tactical yeah. signal signals basically mm. so i did that so i went down to pool after a year as a general marine did two years as an fsfc and then i did selection after that mm. tell me about selection there is so many rumors about how tough selection is i want to i want to delve deep into this was was selection for special forces it was sbs that you went that you that you got selected for tell me about that how tough that is to get in there yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's the same now, Special Forces, SBS and SAS. It's been a joint selection for many years. So it's the same course. Just at the end of it, you just go to your respective units. Mm. It comes back to the same as Royal Marines training. It, it is a very hard course. And the only way that you get through it is that deep desire. So it starts off with the hills phase in Brecon, which everyone, that's probably the most publicized yeah. part of it, marching around, heavy loads. And again, yes, physically it is taxing. You're carrying heavy weight and it is taxing on the body, but maybe the hardest part of it, it's like Groundhog Day. For three weeks, you, are, you basically wake up. I did it in winter, so it's dark. You wake up 5 a.m., go to the cookhouse, imagine like a greasy cooked breakfast that you're trying to force down because you need the calories. And then you drag yourself down to the, the parade square where the vehicle, the four ton trucks are, sitting in the drizzling rain, in the dark, get on the trucks, drive for an hour or two hours. You're trying to doze, get a bit of sleep on there. You get out, your name's called, show me where you are on a map, point it out, We're like right off you go. And then that's you on your own for eight hours, trudging around the shittest mm. terrain, mm in what like marshy boggy tripping over rain wind it's mm. just shit on yeah. your own with your own thoughts in wales in wales and again that's what breaks a lot of people it's yeah. just that monotony because you will start to question you're like why am i doing this yeah. it, it's not like going to say a sports tournament where you know when athletes they think of the hard part is whatever they're doing on that day yeah but it's not well, it is, but actually it's the three years in the closed doors with no crowd, the monotonous day in, day out training. That's what the boredom, the grind, that's what people find hard and won't stick at. And the only way you stick at it and get through it is I believe in this so much and I am going to pass this course. And you've got to want to pass it for the sake of passing it itself. If you're trying to do it for more cash, for prestige, for the cute, like any of those external factors, you'll just quit because mm. it's so shit when you're doing it. You have to have such a deep desire. It's an obsession. You can't care about anything else. Yeah. All you can care about is passing that course. Mm. And so you do the Wales phase and that in itself, it's the most publicized, but it's, it's not selection. All that is is a culling phase to get rid of people who aren't suitable to go to the jungle phase. And the jungle phase is selection. Like that is selection. So give me an example. How many people went into the Welsh phase? We are mine. There was 222, something like that. How many of that broke and buckled? I think we took, and it was quite a big amount, we took 80 two or 83 wow. to the jungle. Okay. So rough, yeah, over half dropped out on that initial phase. Mm. So that 80, so when they dropped out, did any of those boys look you now and go, I failed or they broke me or how did they feel? No, so luck, and in, luck does play into it. Some yeah. people are injured and they're devastated by it, but they'll come back again. Yeah. Some people, I think it's just a bit of an awakener. Maybe they didn't realize exactly 
what it was going to be. And or, or it's, it's a realization for, for some people. And I've had this conversation with people, they go on and they realize, actually, I, it's not that I don't want it enough. Like yeah. it's not, they, they think they do. And then they go on it and they realize, no. But you actually nailed it a minute ago, because if you're going there for an extra pound note to earn more money, or you're doing it for prestige to say, I've, I've got through, they are the wrong factors. You're not going to do it. Yeah. It's like you on your, you know, business journey. Yeah. If you have to be obsessed. I'm obsessed, obsessed in business. I mean, yeah. you're obsessed. You make things work. You have yeah. to make it work. Because you didn't, you know, you're not going to, you don't make a million overnight. Yeah. It's, and if Doesn't you're, happen. if that's what you're there for, if you're mm. like, I have to get those results, you're not going to stick with mm. it. You're not going to go through the dark times. Yeah. Like you, you need to, and it's the same with any goal. If you are only obsessing at the end result and you're not engaged with the process or can find enjoyment with the process. And here's the thing, you know, I'm talking about all this and saying, it's hard and there's a lot of sacrifice. I would say I enjoyed the process of training for selection almost as much, if not more, than passing it. Yeah. And if the you, journey, isn't the it? The journey. Yeah. Yeah. I love training for it and building up to it. I didn't see it as a sacrifice because again, that's what I cared about. That's what I believed in. Mm. And and that testing myself and going through it is so much satisfaction in that mm. that those are the that's how that's what gets you through. You need that. If you want to achieve something, whatever it is, you have to find joy in the process. Mm. Otherwise, what's the point? You're fucking miserable. Mm. Like, I agree. Totally agree. How old were you when you went when you went for this selection? I was 26, I think, 27. 26. Yeah, 26. So 27. when you passed, did they actually say to you after three weeks in, in Wales, right, you've passed, now you're going to the jungle? No, no. So, so basically, Welsh phase culling it's just to get your plane ticket to the jungle and then jungle is selection so the jungle is six weeks two weeks kind of build up and then four weeks living in the trees doing it's basically soldering that's what's really testing testing your soldering and at the end of that if if you can make it past the first week so in the first week it's so hot, so humid. They basically thrash you around to again cull more people, and every day you're just going past guys on drips. They're just part. They're just gone. Yeah. They're just down. There's just medical people like bringing yeah. them back around. If you can get past that first week, physically you can probably get to the end of the jungle, bar any injury. And then once you're at the end, you fly out. You still don't know if you passed. You fly back to Hereford. And then they bring you into a room and names get called out. And it, I think it changes each time, but the names that were called out on mine were the people that have failed. And we had, so we're on the initial selection, 220 odd start in Wales and 17 passed. Is that right? So it went from 220, jungle. but down to 80. 80 went to the jungle, down to 17. Yeah. Wow. Passed. And then after that, it's, you don't really people don't tend to fail after that. It's kind of continuation and other bits. But if, if you pass the jungle, you pretty much passed selection. Amazing. I want to roll back to the jungle. I don't want to miss, skip this bit out. You've gone boom, forget six weeks there. I want to know what, you know, for someone like myself, I'm trying to get my head around, right, being in a jungle, number one. Yeah. Number two, I'm thinking snakes, I'm thinking insects, I'm thinking, where am I going to sleep? Am I sleeping on the floor? Just explain to me what it looks like and feels like. What have you got? Have you got a backpack? Have you got anyone bringing you food? Any cook? Anyone cooking for you? What is it? So, and whereabouts is it? We were out in Brunei. In Brunei, okay. So it's going to be scorching it's just, and you, humid. You're soaked. Yeah. So from the moment you wake up, so you basically have two sets of rig, two sets of clothing. You have a dry set and your working set. So each day you put your working set on, which is immediately soaked in sweat. And then at night, if you are not on hard routine, so basically hard routine is you're fully tactical and you just sleep on the floor in your clothes. You just lie down on the floor and go to sleep. You were, get you, were, you, were you happy laying on the floor getting a kid? You're, are you you're not so thinking, knackered. Are you, are you you just, are, I cannot explain how hard the jungle is physically. If you imagine being at your absolute limit every single day, like just on that, I would say it took me a year, 12 months plus to fully, uh, to fully feel back physically to pre the jungle. Mm. It taxes, your adrenal system gets so smashed mm. because you can't get enough, because you're on rations the whole time pretty much, getting enough calories. You know, you're carrying on most days Bergens that are 120, 140 pounds. Which is, let's break that down, what's that, 2.2, what, 40 kg? Yeah. 40, 50 kg? Yeah, 40, 50 kg. On your back? On your back. It feels like 
your shoulders are getting ripped off. That's heavy. And that is, and you're patrolling, doing tactical patrolling in that heat, in the humidity. It's just, it's incredibly, the jungle is the one of the, probably the most taxing environment mm. I've ever soldiered in. Mm. And having the pressure of selection on top of that, it's why it's there for a reason because it's so testing. If you can make it through that and soldier to a good standard, that's why it's there because the end product is special forces. Well, 80, 80 people went into that and 63 didn't make it. And that's and that's people that are, you have to remember, everyone that starts on that first day of selection are already Royal Marines commandos, parachute regiment, people who have done Afghans, Iraqs, like experiences. Yeah. Exper everyone at the beginning, and this is where the mindset comes in, physically is capable of passing that course. So it then comes down to mindset, and skills and really the skills side of it and i think this applies across life it's the basics like you know we say special forces it's, it's nothing really special about it. it's actually the opposite it's doing the basics very well mm. and the jungle is very good for doing that if you are not good at your admin like, like simple things like keeping yourself clean in those conditions and looking after yourself, you will degrade so quickly that you just won't function. So getting the basics right, the very basics of soldiering, of patrolling, of doing contact drills, that's what it's there to test. Because that's once you have that solid foundation, that's what you build everything else from. Mm. How many days were you in the jungle for? So it's four, you're in there basically for four weeks solid. <laughs> so imagine what you look like after <laughs> four weeks in the same clothes, no washing, Cam cream. Give just... me an example of the food. You said rations a minute ago. What sort of rations did you have? Mate, delicious. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, tell me what's it. Tell me what was rations in your rations. Are, yeah. Rations are pff, basically get your breakfast, your main meal, and then a load of snacks. And it's just I, I don't know. There's maybe four thousand calories. It's just calories. It's like you they, say. You say rations though. You there with the tin pot cooking it up in the morning? It, what is it coming a packet? Or cold? It? Yeah. So it's in a packet. Okay. So it's either boil, boil in a pot of water. You can eat it cold so a lot of the time you are just eating it cold yeah. um but yeah stick it in water boil in the bag eat it out of the bag it's all packaged it tastes they're a lot better than they were now they're actually all right yeah but it's just calories you just need to get as many calories on board mm. as you can and what were you actually doing in there though? you're waking up give me an example of a day you're waking up are you are you shooting in there are you are you practicing rolling around and looking and maps and just i just want to get an just, overview yeah. it's not my world so i just want to get an overview of what your sort of day was just imagine basic soldiering skills so exactly that can you navigate with a map and compass and imagine being in a jungle with the trees where everything looks the same it is so hard so hard to navigate in the jungle so it might be that you're doing a patrol x so you are basically they just give you points to get to. So as a patrol, you just need to navigate around to different points, carrying heavy loads. So again, being knackered, being fatigued, try not to think about the 140 pounds on your back, pulling your shoulders off, <laughs> trying to think and understand map to ground, being very focused. You have to be on it all the time, being aware of your surroundings. How far have I gone? What distance am I covering? What's my pacing? You know, whereabouts am I? Or another day, maybe doing range work. So it's just practicing and again the, the general military practices as well it, it's just break contact drills i.e you're a small patrol you're walking along you come under enemy contact and so you have to return fire and then extract yourself from that situation so laying down covering fire you know heat everyone's seen the film heat mm. like that was probably one of the best examples that scene where they're doing the the bank robbery mm. and they come into fire if you watch them they are, one will move while one other is firing and they'll just bound. So you've always got someone laying down, covering fire while the other person moves. So get very basic drills. You, you don't do anything. People have this view that you're doing these crazy things. It's not, it's yeah. very simple tactical maneuvers, but it's how well can you execute those in a very testing environment yeah. under a lot of pressure. Yeah. And it's live rounds. So... You don't want to get it wrong. No. So give an example. So if someone's in there now and you're the you, age of you, are you seeing people put their hands up? I've had enough. Get me out of here. How does it work? Are they yeah. So people just voluntary withdrawal. So some people will get medically taken out if you know they've gone down or can't cope. Yeah. But apart from that, you don't get failed. It's not like, 
oh, you failed, get out. Yeah. That doesn't happen to the end. In the jungle, unless you are unsafe and got pulled out for a safety reason, then you'll just carry on through. But people will just quit. And a big thing that gets people is during that entire process, you don't really get any feedback on how you're doing. Mm. And that's very hard for a lot of people. You think about life, how often do you not get any feedback mm. on how you're doing at something through school, through everything we're doing, we usually get feedback. Mm. And because it's such a hard environment and you mess up all the time, people get in their own heads. And when they've made mistakes, they just think, oh, well, I failed. So what is the point? Why continue putting myself through hell? And then what usually happens is they, they quit, they leave the jungle, and then you have a, a leaving interview with the commanding officer and they ask you, how do you think you were doing? And like, oh, terrible, that's why I quit. Like, no, actually you were doing pretty good. You're on, on route to pass. But, th but that's part of it. People yeah. get in there. You know, everyone messes up. They're probably the one of the worst days I had. We were late. We were due to meet our DS, the instructor, at a certain point. And so we were, were kind of rushing to get there. We had to fill up water. And all the patrol were across. There's a, a big log bridge that we had to cross across the stream. Um, they were all one side. And me and another guy were filling up our water bottles. And as I was walking back up the muddy bank, I kind of slipped and dropped my water bottle. And this, one of the, the other guys in the patrol told me afterwards, he said he turned to one of the lads and said, oh, Jefferson's having a bad day, isn't he? You'll probably fall off that bridge next. Funny old thing, come across, walking across this massive log rope bridge, slipped, fell about 10 feet off this bridge, luckily into the mud, but then I was covered in mud. My weapon was covered in mud. Oh, fuck's sake. <laughs> Get up. Meet the DS. What's the first thing he says? Right, everyone strip down your weapons to show me your weapon, which should be gleaming clean yeah. at any time. So it's like you just hand over a weapon that's covered in mud. Yeah. And you can't do anything. You just, you're like, well, pff, that's a black mark, but yeah. you just got to get on with it. But I never, to me, I was never going to pull myself off. I was going to make it to the end. And if I wasn't good enough, I wasn't good enough. Mm. But those are the kind of things people just get in their own heads. Mm. And then they're like, what's the point? Can you get to the end of that four weeks and, and then say, sorry, you didn't pass? Yeah, so that's what happens. So you have the, however, I can't remember how many finished the jungle phase, but then it's after that, you come back to the UK and you're in a room and they just call names and you the are names joking, are called. Mate. That is brutal. Yeah, it is. And that is really brutal. Yeah. So you, you could do all of the Wales thing. You could get out to the yeah. jungle for four weeks, being pushed mentally, physically, that you're broken for them to come back to land in England and say, sorry, mate, you didn't make it. Yeah. And I know people have gone through that twice and had two, they call it a stand-up stand -up fails. They've gone that and had two fails. So they've done it all again. And it's bad enough the first time, doing it a second time. And failed the second time. And failed the second time oh, as well. mate. But, but it's... <laughs> that, is, that is brutal, isn't it? Yeah, I know But I know guys that have been What did they fail on? Give me an example. So look, you, you, you've smashed whales, you've smashed the jungle, you're all camaraderie, you get to the end of the jungle, you're all looking at each other again, you know what, I, I think I've got through this. What did they fail on? <sighs> Your skills, basically. So the whole time you're being watched. So the DS are there with the notepad and they're just constantly making notes. So it could be anything, you know, tactical, patrolling skills. A lot of it is on the ranges. So how you are in those break contact drills. So essentially the kind of firefight training. A lot of that is make or break. So if you don't do very well on those, that's usually a big black mark. So often it's just... The, the usual reason is, you know, you clear you haven't got enough experience or you're falling short on yeah. these skills. Go away, practice them, and then come back on wow. and have another go. So it's usually a skill. Mm. Sometimes it is a face doesn't fit. They have tried as much as possible to remove that out, as in to remove that bias. So half or towards the end, you switch D your DS, your instructors mm. that are assigned to you, so a different person's looking. Mm. Because you do, it does happen, you know. So you roll back there, you said a f if a face doesn't fit. Yeah. That's the same as in if you're playing rugby at a high level and your coach actually doesn't like you yeah. and doesn't pick you, sit on the bench all, every week. You go to another team, mm -hmm. he plays you first, then you end up playing for England or, or, or top yeah. level. Is that the same yeah. here? Okay. I think it's the same. They try and remove it by putting those parameters in place, but it's human nature. We naturally warm to some people yeah, okay. and not to others. And you see it... Yeah, James was in it was in Royal Marines as well. You see it in basic training. If the training team, you know, for Royal Marines or whatever, if the training team likes you and generally if you're fit, lad, mm. you know, if you do, you, you get more passes yeah. on stuff. You know, they, when they're doing kit inspections, 
you may you know a little misdemeanor they find something they're like but if they don't like you they will find something of you yeah. every time and, and they would thrash yeah. you until you leave basically yeah. and it's it shouldn't sometimes oh, it's a tough one sometimes it's warranted with people that probably shouldn't be there but when it's not warranted it's tough yeah that's really hard because someone's getting hammered basically just because that person and like i said hopefully that is mitigated by the ds changing because then they get that fresh yeah. person seeing them and like, well, actually, I think they're a good bloke. Yeah. But it does still, it does still yeah. happen. So you finish the four weeks, you fly straight back to London. How long is it until you get the nod to say, yes, you passed? So, you, yeah, you fly back to the UK yeah. and then you've got another three, roughly three months um, without but, knowing. But you know, well, you've pa once you've passed the jungle, you pretty much, you'd have to do, you'd have to, mess up pretty badly to then fail after that. So you pretty much know at that point, and then you've got three months of your parachute training and various other bits, mm. and then you're kind of done and off to your unit. So you pretty much know at that okay. point. And you say off to your unit, when's the day when they say, uh, how does it work? Is it like you are now in the special forces, you are now in the SBS, you're now in the SAS. Did you know your route before yeah. you wanted to? Okay. So you choose before, um, you, when I did it, I don't know if it's changed now that you put in, so you go, I'm, you know, you're going on, you choose your unit beforehand, yeah. go through a selection and then you pass. And then, so guys going to Paul, going to Paul, and then yeah. guys going to SAS, go to Hereford. And then you're just in your job, basically. Okay. In your role. And do you get, what sort of, what sort of money was it compared in the Royal Marine to then being selected and say, well, I'm now in the SBS? You get spec pay. So you just get, um, well, it's funny. They call it retention pay. Mm. So you probably get, I can't actually remember, you're probably getting an extra 15 grand a year, maybe. Okay. Depending, it depends what you get. It depends the what, level, yeah. what level you're at beforehand. Yeah. But it is, so generally for most people, they're getting more. But because they call it retention pay, and it does work, because if, so in the military, if you want to leave, you need to give a year's notice, mm. which is bonkers. You've got to give yeah. a year's notice if yeah. you've had enough. Yeah. So unless you've got you know special circumstances, you give a year to leave. So you've got twelve months. And if you hand your notice in, they're not going to like you for the next twelve months. Mm. Or are they or they are they. No, I, I haven't seen that. That no, doesn't okay. really come into it because people leave for you know if you've got a valid reason, you just want to leave or had enough. Yeah. But you lose that retention pay, so it traps a lot of people. If you've got a mortgage and things like that for that oh, entire okay. year, you lose all of that extra special forces pay. So you're still doing the same job for a year and not getting paid. So, for example, how much would you be getting as a, a Royal Marine, roughly? <sighs> Come on. What do you get? I mean, when you're in training, yeah. when you first when you're a recruit, you're on like six hundred and fifty quid a month or something, right, okay. bonkers. But and including then, you get your accommodation and food thrown yeah. in. Yeah. Okay. And then after that, what are you on? Twenty. No, yeah. 900 quid a month to yeah. be a Royal Marine. Yeah. But you don't do well, it for... No, I know you don't yeah. do it, but if you think about it, what's that, 12 Gs a year, roughly? It's probably less. I don't know what it is. 12 grand a year plus your food and your... And then when you want to jump, don't tell me that it's... <laughs> no, so it goes by that does... point, because by that point in your career, you're probably like mid-20s. Let's say you're okay. on... Most, I would say on average... As a as someone going on selection, say you've been in a few years corporal or something, you probably mid twenties, mid to mid say to thirty grand. Yeah. Okay. And then you jump up to your forty fives, fifties in SBS yeah, and SAS. That's, that's probably roughly the wall ballpark. And what do you reckon the package looks like if you were like, well, okay, I get free accommodation, I get loads of perks, I get my food, I get all perks everywhere. Mate, do you, you think you could package food. it up or? I'd never the entire time I was a military. I don't think I ever ate on good shit. Right. Okay. Well, on um, camp. Yeah. It's just. <laughs> Shit. Give me example, give me an example of what just, sort of food they would give you. It's because Is it, a canteen. It's because it got taken over so long a while ago. The military, you used to a set amount of your pay was taken out each month to cover food, and food at that time was pretty good. When I joined in two thousand and eight, it was just changing. Sodexo won the contract, yeah. so it got changed to like privatized. And so it was then just you go and pay when you go to the cookhouse or galley or whatever it is. And it was just because the food was crap, not as many people went, and so the less was going into it. So it was just a perpetual, like yeah. self-perpetuating. Yeah. So yeah. it was just, yeah, it's just crap. Shame, food. isn't it? Yeah, Shame. it was. Yeah. What about what about the uh, the moment when you get your beret? How does that? Is there a big parade or is it? No, just a, yeah, just a very simple, very simple, low key, just ceremony on camp because it's 
all meant to be. And what do they give you? You just get a berry and a belt. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, Jeff, as well yeah. done, mate. You've done, you've done. <laughs> that's, that's basically what it yeah. is. But okay. again, it's not. It's no not meant one, to be. Uh, uh, no yeah, one does yeah. it for that. It's yeah. not. Uh, yeah. How did you yeah. feel when you knew you'd passed and given your berry that day? <laughs> to be honest, that wasn't for me. The defining moment for me was I didn't even know if I'd passed. It was actually leaving the tree. So finishing in the jungle and you get a helicopter out back to the main army camp. So you leave, like physically leave the jungle. And on that flight out, I just remember sat in the helicopter, looking out over the tree camp and, uh, canopy. I just feeling like, you know, I'd, I'd done everything, I'd given everything, mm. I'd done all that I could. And so whether or not I passed, I knew I couldn't have done anymore. Yeah, okay. So if I wasn't good enough, I wasn't good enough. And that for me was the most satisfying, that was a more satisfying moment yeah. than actually getting the berry. I was like, well, I did it. I got through the trees and I gave it my all. So whatever happens. Mm. So it was, you know, it was nice getting that berry, but actually that was far more fulfilling because it was a, it was an internal marker that I checked for myself yeah. as opposed to an external one yeah. getting handed the berry. Yeah, that's a nice way to put it. And it's also, and I think that in life, again, if you if you can if you can live up to your own, set yourself standards and values and live up to that, it would be mu it's much easier to find happiness and yeah. fulfillment in life than if you're always waiting for someone Externally. else to Agreed. validate what you've done. Yeah, mate, totally agree. So then when you come back then, you were based down in Poole, what was what was that world like for you down here? And have you been on any tours? Yeah, so I did I did three tours of Afghan. Um, what years? Like, I did two. It was two thousand and ten, eleven, and then two thousand and fourteen and fifteen. Was there any one of those tours that stands out in your mind? Probably the last one that I did because it was the most interesting. I had a lot of autonomy on that. Um, so I was working in Kabul um, in the city and I was attached to a different unit, very small. There was like eight of us, I think, living in this sort of small house compound in Kabul, had a lot of leeway. I was training one of the indigenous and the Afghan arrest forces and doing jobs with them. And it was just a lot of independence. You know, I was, I was driving around, I had this battered Hilux like truck you're just driving around the city on your own if I had to go out, go to an embassy or go to a camp to, to pick up stuff or whatever. And it's just a surreal, I just remember, you know, driving around just thinking how surreal. I'm just in Kabul mm. and Afghan, mm. essentially in a war zone, just cutting around on my own. Mm. And it was just one of those, I think, you know, I'm never going to do anything like this again. Was there, was there one of those tours that was more violent? The ones... I'd, no, not in particular. Like tours are a real potluck in terms of what happened, like whether they're busy, whether they're not. Some You can go out with a squadron and not do many jobs and then another squadron can take over and they can be going out all the time. So it's very much sort of random mm. what happens. So when you say you're going out, so you, explain where you were living. How, what sort of accommodation were you living in? What did you have to wear every day? Were you walking around with machine guns? Were you, were you just explain? So yeah, I get an overview. A, yeah, it's funny, isn't it? Because you because it's something you're used to. You forget that for people, yeah, you're not in. It's like a very different. It's for us. So it's very different. The difference between I think when people think of Afghan, you either think of the big bases like Kandahar or Bastion, yeah. and then you have the small outposts um, where guys are just patrolling out each day. For us, we, a lot of the time, you're based out of the big ones like Kandahar um, or Bastion. And so that is camp life, the same as everyone else. You're just wearing normal military uniform, going about. The difference between what special forces do and what general uh, army or marine units are doing is they will be out in outposts, so FOBs, forward operating bases, and their job is to hold that area or try and protect that area. And so they will just be walking out and patrolling every day. Mm. And actually in many ways, 
that is harder and more dangerous because they're in one position and they're just walking out and they're basically rolling the dice. Rolling the dice with with if Afghans if, putting bombs underneath. Yeah, you're rolling. Imagine every day. I mean, this and this is I never did one of those tours. Imagine every day for six months, you are essentially going. I might walk out and lose my limbs or get blown up. Like every day. Imagine the mental toll mm. on that. Like I'm going to walk out and I don't know if the next step I take, that's me gone. And so that is very taxing. Whereas in special forces, the ironic thing is. In many ways, it's a lot safer because you are targeting high profile targets. You will get intelligence on where potentially they are. You will have air assets. You will have drones up watching that target for days, soaking up the pattern of life. So watching what's going on. And then you will fly in in the middle of the night, night vision goggles, land on that, you know, zero dark 30, land on that compound and arrest that target you know neutralize arrest that target and so you have all of the advantages the deck is stacked in your favor mm. whereas for those lads out doing those um you know general yeah. in, in the fobs so you know take my hat off and remember a lot of those lads 17 18 yeah. years old doing yeah. that it's you know we put i think special forces on a pedestal actually a lot of those guys did a lot more gnarly yeah. stuff yeah than in many ways a lot of people have done Mm. in special forces so you'll get you'll get intelligence who are you going to arrest <laughs> yeah i mean this is where politics comes into it just whoever they consider to be high profile targets so i couldn't even tell you mm. because and this is like did no you one, care no no okay i don't think anyone like looking back could i now with when i joined the military you don't you don't think about politics i wanted to join the military because you know, it appealed to me, the adventure, the job, whatever, all those aspects. And then you go in and you go and you're sent where you're sent and you go into those jobs. Let's be, you know, does anyone think we're in Afghan mm. or Iraq for really, that's not a noble. Mm. The only people I've met, forces that I've met that really kind of buy into that are some of the American guys who really buy into that. Yeah, we're going out there and taking democracy. It's politics, yeah. it's business, yeah. it's cash that drives all these things. Mm. Like morally, could I go now and do some of those jobs? <laughs> I mean, yeah, we were taking so a lot of the dudes that we were going after are were doing bad things. Yeah. And so on a micro level, does that then help some people in that? Yeah, hopefully it does. If we look at it on I mean it, let's no one thinks it was a success. Afghan was a massive failure. Um why was it a massive failure? I think when I say that, if you're taking it on the facts of we were there for what a 10 however many years and then within the space of what six months after leaving it was back to exactly what it you know taliban took back control within yeah. a matter of months yeah. after years and years of spending billions yeah so i mean how can you not say that that isn't a failure when you're going in how many of you are going in on a night shift with the head guards and whatever you're trying to arrest someone or take someone out it varies, depends on the jobs. Um, towards the end, when it was more Afghan-led, there was maybe 10, 15. Back previous to that, maybe in 30. On big jobs, it could be even more, but say, take it on average, 20 to 30. So there were 20, 30 of you going in to do a job? Yeah. How do you know if someone's the Taliban or just a normal Afghan farm worker or what have you? You take it on, so you take interpreters with you. And you do, like biometric testing was coming in, so fingerprint scans and stuff, if they're already in the system or if they're trying to shoot at you. Mm. There's, a, there's <laughs> another one. So what's the, is there a rule or, a, or some sort of rule or law that yeah. you take, you've got to take someone out before they take you out? Because if someone was pulling a shooter on me, I would want to take them out straight away. Is there something that you can't yeah. do that? Or do you have to then, if you did do that, you then got to go and report it back. And there's a big report to do and it could be headache. It's rules of engagement. So it's, yeah, you've got rules of engagement where it's, it needs to be. It's almost, I guess, similar to the threat to life in the UK, as in if you believe that your life is in danger and you have valid reason, you need to be able to justify yeah. essentially what the actions um, that you took or are taking. Mm. Do you remember taking any people out? I knew that question was. It's always an interesting, why do you think people are interested in that? Like, as a, I guess, a civilised society, why people find that as an interesting 
part of it mm. is what I always find because I was trying to think back you know James and I were chatting about this before I joined the military I think it was something I ever thought about and I, it wasn't I don't know anyone personally and even when I was in it's not something it's massive you know guys don't go around talking about how many people they've killed or no they keep it they keep it quiet but I find it quite intriguing on the mindset of it's either you four are about to kill me or I take you out before. I think it comes more down to you. everything that you do is for the people around you. Like it, And again, it comes back to the question of politics. I don't know anyone in the military that I served with that was doing that job because of they belief in some kind of belief of a greater good mm. they were doing that job because it was a job they wanted to do and through that the bond that you form with the people around you i guess just a more intense or extreme version of say a sports team that mm. play for each other and you put yourselves on the line for each other that's what you're doing like everything is about the person next to you like when i think back you know the most I guess intense moments are, you know, you, you're flying in on that helicopter to do a job and you start to get a countdown. So when you're 10 minutes out, you're starting to sort of change your mindset and ramp up. You know, you may have been on a helicopter for an hour or so, kind of dozing away because it's, you know, two in the morning and you, okay, 10 minutes out, you're starting to ramp up. You start to think about the job, taking off the warm jacket and then it's five minutes out and now you're really starting to ramp out. You're checking your weapon's good to go, your kit's good to go, and then you're two minutes out and you're kneeling at the, in two columns at the uh, back of the the tailgate of the helicopter and you've just got your guy over to your left and then, yeah, I can feel the goosebumps mm -hmm. now and you've got 60 seconds and the tailgate's coming down and you're coming into target and it's just you and that guy next to you and that is, that's all you're thinking about. It's like, I am going to do the job to the best of my ability for these people mm -hmm. next to me because I know that they will be doing that for me so, yeah. and that's what everyone and that's why i think when you leave the military what you miss the most is that and that's what everyone misses because you just cannot you cannot create recreate yeah. that in yeah. any other sphere it's such an intense bond that you get mm. um and that's what it's definitely what i miss mm. Mm. interesting was there ever a moment you come unstuck unstuck as in in trouble you thought, mm. shit, I'm in trouble here. I, do you know what? The, the closest one I had on operations, no. There was probably one, I actually went on one of the the last tours that I did. There was, we were clearing a compound and I was on a corner and it was pretty much cleared and nothing had been found. So we were like, oh, it's going to be pretty quiet. And then about 20 meters along the wall from where I was, grenade went off and a load of machine gun fire erupted. One of our guys got, and one of the Afghans we were with, got frag from the grenade. What's and frag? So like the bit... Um, the fragments coming the fragments, off, okay, yeah, yeah. off the grenade. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Took some frag. And it kicked off a whole load of dust and you're on night vision goggles and you couldn't see anything and I knew so the guy that got hit had, was off somewhere beyond that and whoever the, the insurgents that were firing was somewhere in that and firing through this dust cloud that you can't see and I basically then knew I had to cross across that to get to the other side where because it had come across the radio that one of our other guys had gone to the guy that got fragged needed help to pull him out and so you know you have to go across this open space essentially where Sitting that duck. fire is coming yeah. through but you don't even i think that's the point of that bond it, it, it doesn't even come the, the question of whether to do it or not isn't it doesn't even come up it's more of a case of a quick well this is happening then <laughs> and you, you just kind of do it but actually one of the the only time or one of the closest times where i thought i was really going to sort of something really bad was going to happen or was going to catch it up either end up severely injured or, or worse was actually climbing like on a climbing course in special forces 
down in Devon of all places. And you know, long story short, because you put your own protection in when you're climbing, you, you're kind of putting little bits of kit into the rock. And I was climbing up and I was nearly at the ledge where it was kind of the safe point and my foot slipped and I fell and all the bits that I put in started to pull out. So I was falling and it almost goes in slow motion. I'm just hearing ping, ping, ping as like each bit of kit comes out. And so in my head, and it's not even, it's not even a panic. It's almost an acceptance of, well, this is gonna fucking hurt. Mm. And the very last piece held and I swung down, smacked into the rock and I stopped a foot maybe from the ground. And the guy who was holding the other end of the rope speaking with me was like, at ah, ghost white. <laughs> Cause he thought he was just about to witness. Oh, man. But it is, you know, training, training, you know, it has to cut in many ways as close to the bone as possible. And through, you know, there was a, a guy unfortunately died on my boats course. Um, another guy survived, but got shot on a different course. On my parachute course, two guys collided at 500 feet and fell to the ground. How they didn't die, I don't know, but shattered ankles, broken pelvis, ruptured spleen, shoulders. Because it's just the nature of that world by its very nature. It how did the has guy, to be like that. How did the guy die in the boat? He drowned. So drowned. We were doing drills. Um, Where were you? That was down in Devon again as well. Okay. Yeah. What sort of drills were you doing? Just gen- It was just surf drills. We were just doing, just doing de- uh, general um nothing crazy it was just unfortunate it, it wasn't no one did anything wrong it was just an unlucky accident what sort of drills were you doing in training once you're in the sbs you're not in afghan you're not uh iraq or wherever you're back here training i see a lot of the helicopters go off the coast here yeah do they is it true they drop you off like three miles out and go up make your way back no no okay <laughs> okay good i've never there's yeah. some rumors flying around then i've i've not yeah i've not done that it's just like again it's nothing there's nothing particularly crazy about it yeah, but i think you're very humble saying it's nothing too crazy about it and when we're talking here this is a whole new world to 99.9 of people yeah. listening to this and i reckon there's a lot of crazy shit that you boys have got up to because i've got some friends who are <laughs> been serving and are still serving in SBS and stuff and they're, they've all got a they're all on another level but it's I think this comes back to again what people perceive it as hard actually it's a really easy life and what I mean by that and even on operations mm. people think that that is hard in many ways it's easier than day to day life and what I mean by that is when you're doing something that really aligns with who you are and you love what you're doing, Mm. even though stuff is hard, it's actually easier. And actually the life as a soldier, because like I said, so much is, you don't have to worry about the dentist, Mm. medical stuff. Like if you want to eat on camera, like it's all taken care of. And on operations, life is simple. So all you have to worry about is, is my kit good to go? That's basically it, am I ready for the job? You know, physical training, you've got the gym, go to the gym, do your training, go and do the job. So outside of, let's remove, okay, if something traumatic happens and repercussions of that, but outside of that, it's a simple life. Yeah. You're with your mates, going to the gym, sunbathing, yeah. going out doing jobs, and then coming back. You don't have, there's no commute, you're not yeah. in traffic, there's no bills to worry about, yeah. you're not having an argument. You're like, it's it's simply, it, it removes all of the stresses that make life hard for a lot mm. of people. And it, you know, my stark contrast with it, I, in my entire military career, I cannot think of a time where I remember being stressed about things. Yeah. I was pretty happy the entire time. When I left and got a job in corporate London, those two years were more stressful for yeah. me than anything I ever mm. did in the military. It's a lot, it's a, it's very similar to the rugby boys. They're in a bubble for 10 years. Bubble is the word. Yeah. You're in a bubble where you've got your yeah. mates, you've taken the piss, you're having a laugh. It's camaraderie it's yep. community it's food it's fighting for each other on the pitch as you guys looking after each other was there ever a point in the eight years when you were in the SBS you go I can't be doing this for the rest of my life I need to see what else is out there that's that's why I left I, for me it was a, the, the strange thing is that I always knew I wanted to be in the military but I always knew that it wasn't going to be something that I would do forever I didn't want to do a full career and I think 
once I'd passed selection, having driven towards such a big goal for a long time, although I enjoyed the job afterwards, I think I already started to get that itch of like, what's what's the next big challenge? Mm. What what can I do? And by the time I left, I'd done selection, I'd done three tours, I'd done everything I wanted to do. And I just asked myself, if I leave now, will I regret it? And there was some, you know, a few other bits that would have been good to do, but that could have happened in 12 months or I could have waited five years. And so I decided to joy to leave in my early 30s rather than later. And I didn't know exactly what I was going to do, but I knew it was something I knew I needed or wanted another big challenge. And the reason I went to, to London was purely my partner at the time got a job there. So I was like, well, you know, maybe that's it. Maybe, you know, the corporate world and going through that. And then about two weeks into it, I realized that was definitely not. Were you like getting a tube into work, wearing a oh, suit, mate. in a in an office with, you must have been piss boring it's, for you. It just didn't. Like the contrast. Yeah, it did. Yeah, tube into London, management consultancy. Very lucky. You know, the company that I work for was great. The people were really great, but it just didn't. The only way I can what describe was the com- it. What was the is, company? It was. It was called Rise Management Consultant. Okay. So it was. I was. I had a project in Covent Garden. It's like going for SBS to a project in Covent Garden. <laughs> Capco, who own all the property there, were redoing all of the lighting. So it's project managing that. So, mate, I'd turn up to meetings in Capco, like be M- engineers, M and E guys, architects, laying out all this. I had no yeah, idea yeah. what. So you're kind of cuffing it, but. But you're a good team player and you're good at building teams around you and camaraderie. It's organisation. Organised, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I, but that whole thing, because it, what I realised very quickly was that it just wasn't me, didn't align with me. And it's almost like a friction between who you are and then the life you're living. Yeah. And that was the first time, you know, felt stressed about stuff, started to lack consistency in my training, problems in like all of those other things. And this is where... I think that alignment piece is so key because if I look at my journey, so at that point I realized, okay, that, this isn't for me. I need to figure out what it was. And so I really set about that. Realized that it was business in some sense. I was like, right, I want to be my own boss. And specifically, I want a digital business. So, lap, so I want geographical freedom from yep. work from everywhere. Teamed up with John, who I'd been in the military with, and then made every mistake in the book. You know, We read all the books on entrepreneurship and business. And we chased cash in the beginning. Tried yeah. loads of random, random things. So were you do? Were you? Were you? Did you have a side business while yeah. you're being paid? So you were getting your. Yeah. How much were you on in the city then? Like 50, 50, 50 grand yeah. at the same time. Thinking, I'm definitely not. This is definitely not for me. We yeah. need to be building something on the side here. Yeah. Okay. So that. And what was that thing on the side? <laughs> Mate, every, we did. tried everything. Go on, give me, S- give me. Imported stuff from China, selling okay. on Amazon. Yeah. We had some random like <laughs> betting thing where we had some some dude in like Slovakia logging in to like do spread betting stuff <laughs> mate, on, oh, mate I was speaking to him I remember you'd like Skype him and we just it looked like an eastern block he'd be on a wire bed like yeah. smoking a cigarette like <laughs> Like it's so random. <laughs> so we did all these random things. We had so John can code. So we had this little software that Who's we started John, to your build. Business partner. Yeah, business yeah. partner that I was in and the so that I served yeah. with. And we basically ended up we chased cash, it all failed. After two years of working that corporate job and side hustle, basically lost both of us, lost all of our savings. So everything we saved in the military, yeah. like blown it all on these side hustles, hadn't worked, you know, spent countless hours, which probably contributed to the relationship ending. And so at that point, we're like, well, we've got no cash. We, luck, you know, I'm very grateful for it. We both moved back into my parents back mm-hmm. in Worcestershire on the mm-hmm. farm. So two blokes, mid 30s, broke. We shared a Ford Focus that cost 400 quid. <laughs> Mate, we used to organise because we were single at the time. If we were going to organise dates, we'd organise them at the same venue at the same time. Genuinely, the so, yeah, so, share the, so we share the car to drive there. <laughs> so like back to zero. But at that point, we were like, right, we've, we've got nothing. We're back at the beginning. Let's just do something we actually care about yeah. and are passionate about, which for us was always mindset and performance. Like even in the military, and it's changed a bit now. It's now caught up a lot. But at that time. Like no one was really, you know, we were the only guys doing, CrossFit was just coming in. Yeah. Like it wasn't big. This was 2000 and 2009 and everyone was just classic bodybuilding. Yeah. There was probably 
me and a handful of the guys wearing vibrant fine figures and doing doing crossfit now mm. the whole gym set yeah. was crossfit yeah. and so we were always looking for that kind of edge and even you know before dave brailsford and the team sky and one percent yeah we'd read about um it was clive woodward who first i don't know if you've seen the building jerusalem documentary mm. yeah. so clive woodward and he'd heard about it from a sailor like he was the first guy to really implement that yeah. in a sports team the and he Cup. did it with that 2003 yeah. he implemented the the marginal gains one yeah. percent rule and so we from that point when i heard about that you know we really took that on board and Brilliant. applied it to everything we're doing so we're like let's just start a business around that and that's where the natural edge came from but the point on being aligned with what you're doing you know in the military on the face of it very hard but aligned to who i was i cared about it therefore easy mm. london well paid, success, you know, look success from the outside, yeah. stressed, not happy, not finding fulfillment. Yeah. Stone broke, mid thirties when all your friends are buying houses and getting yeah. married, living back with your parents, yeah. look shit from the outside. Again, feeling happy and fulfilled because yeah. I'm on the right path. It's yeah. like, oh, I'm doing something that I care about. So it's this point that reg it does play into it, but generally, regardless of external circumstances, how happy and fulfilled you are has a lot more to do with how much are you living in line with what you value, with mm. who you really see yourself mm. as. Because that, if you get that right, everything else becomes easier. Yeah. If you get that wrong, everything else is harder. Yeah. So just going back there, the natural edge. Tell me about the natural edge in your business. Yeah, so it's been, we've done again because every journey is a process you know how it started in the beginning is very different now in the beginning we thought it was going to be more of a one and done service so training nutrition mindset sleep you know come and do it we'll do it all and over the years it's transitioned to where we are now which is basically pure mindset and performance because what we've seen is everything we do is driven by mindset yeah. like all of your behaviors your thoughts everything come you know the mind is primary and so if you're struggling for most you know struggling with say going to the gym the blocker is generally not the the functional aspects of that as in physically going to the gym it's the mindset yeah. that means you're not getting up or you're not going after yeah. work or whatever it is and so if you can win that battle and make changes there everything else becomes easier mm. and i would say that the people most of the people that come to us, we don't deal in trauma or anything around that. It's the more general life piece of, I've got all the pieces of the puzzle to be happy. You know, I've got a decent job, the family, whatever it is. And yet I, I procrastinate too much. I find it hard to switch off. I worry about things too much out of my control. I lack self-belief in myself in one or several areas. And lack of purpose does come up. You know, for a lot of these people, they've kind of got to 30s, 40s, and they've kind of been driving, got to a point in their career or got the house. And then it's like, well, oh, what's next? Yeah. What does the next 10, 20 years of my life look like? I think a lot of those people at that age in those sort of 40s, a lot of depression kicks in. Because you, know, you could be 40 and you could be able to have a wonderful job in your 20s and everyone's going, oh, he's jumped, look at the salaries on. When you get into your 30s and 40s or late 30s, 40s, you're still doing that same job, but you're stuck because you can't go and find something else. That's when a lot of a lot of men start to get depressed. They've got a mortgage, they've got around the neck, they've got a job they don't enjoy going to. They've got a couple of kids, maybe a kid in private school. You know, they've got all these bills to meet, but actually deep down, are they happy? It's uh, what I, a couple of things I hear a lot are stuck in a rut, yeah. Groundhog Day. Yeah. Um, someone summed it up once. I was chatting to a guy on the phone. He said, "I feel like I'm trapped in the modern life cycle of work. I feel softer. I feel less resilient. Yeah. It, it's like you've lost that excitement and drive mm. of the twenties, and now you're looking for that next thing. And the, the biggest mistake, and what our core ethos is, is that people." don't treat mindset as a skill set. Mm. What I see most of the time is, you know, everyone understands that to change the physical body, you have to take action and be consistent. Like you can't just listen to a podcast or read a book on diet mm. and expect to lose weight. Mm. And yet with mindset, that's what everyone does. People will read a book or listen to a podcast mm. and then wonder why a few decades worth of neural pathways, patterns and behaviors aren't changing. Like mm. it's bonkers when you mm. think about it. Yeah. And yet we don't really have, 
we've almost so we've got on the one hand those books and podcasts and then on the other end of the spectrum you've got therapy and it doesn't seem there's this what we something in the middle that's what yeah. we, what we have done is over five years of studying and learning as much as possible about behavior change the psychology the neuroscience and working with people is just deconstructed that into a practical step-by-step -step framework mm -hmm. whereby people can actually be consistent with these changes start changing those behaviors because until you do that until you put that work in and make it an active process you're just not going to change yeah. like you it's it's the reason everyone loves to think that they're making conscious logical rational decisions mm -hmm. every day mm -hmm. but the fact of it is and the research is clear you're not and it's very easy to see for yourself that you're not by the sense of how many times do you say you're going to do something oh, i'm definitely going to go to the gym i'm definitely not going to eat this i'm definitely you know i'm going to focus on my work or whatever it is or i'm not going to do these things and then you do the opposite and it happens time and time again if it was as simple as just logically telling yourself i am going to do this or not do this and then following it through well no one would need any help we'd all have six packs be millionaires yeah, yeah. but the fact is we don't and it's because we're driven by our core narrative by the the way that we see ourselves and the way that we see the world and that is pretty much informed by all of your experiences the education systems you've been through the environments you've been in and evolution ties into it a bit from the day you were born to where you are now and it's you know why do you wear the brands that you wear you know, like why you, why do you wear that brand that you're wearing now why am i wearing this mm. shirt you're wearing it because that ties into your identity. Yeah. Why is someone liberal? Why is someone conservative? Why does someone find a joke funny and someone else yeah. find it offensive? You're always gonna act out of that internal narrative, but most of the time it's sitting at that subconscious level. Yeah. Unless you understand really like the, 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 the true reasons why you are or aren't thinking or acting or behaving in a certain way, you're going to find it very hard to change. The analogy I usually use is people try and force action at the point of action itself, i.e. I'm going to force myself to go to the gym. I'm going to force myself to focus. And what you're trying to do there is almost control or stop an avalanche when you need to be looking at the snowball. Yeah. You need to understand, well, why am I thinking about this? Like, Why am I trying to force things? Because force relies on motivation and willpower, which are useful tools but they're pretty much misunderstood and used in the wrong ways. It, it comes back to that identity piece. You really need to understand yourself and why you yeah. do or don't act in a certain way and then change it. Powerful stuff, Jeffers. <laughs> Go it deep, is, mate. It? No, it's good, mate. It's really yeah. good. You, you're talking complete sense. <laughs> do, you, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's fantastic to hear. I like how you've transitioned from the SBS Special Forces. You've gone and done two years in, in the city, realised that it's definitely not for me. You've then got to set up your business now. Who's your ideal customer? Our, I would say Elsie. Elsie. Our ideal customer are people, I'd say 35, 35 to 45, maybe, you know, early 50s. Got to a point in life, again, where they have the piece of the puzzle. Male, female? It's generally males. We have, and I think... That is just perhaps that's the background yeah. or the fact that we're you know guys a bit pill more to guys yeah. I, I don't know but that's generally who um, who we attract so more guys got the pieces of the puzzle so generally got a good job being successful you know business owners managers some kind of um, you know good level or higher level position usually got the family or are married and yet it is all those things I listed are just something feels out of place mm. don't feel fully fulfilled and satisfied I'm lacking self-belief somewhere i do procrastinate too much i worry too much and I, I tell you what's really been interesting over the past few years of doing this is how many people feel like this that you would not think from the yeah. outside the most common thing is if you they say if you wrote my life down on paper and gave it to someone they'd be like this guy this person's smashing it yeah. you know what they're killing it in yeah. life and yet internally they're not feeling like it but because no one talks about this mm. everyone kind of just deals with this in silence mm. deals with it on their own and i hear the same things over and over again on the calls it's the same stuff mm. and it's and i think it's quite eye-opening when people come in and 
to our coaching because we have a couple of group calls a week and other people on the call it's always really interesting for them to suddenly see other people yeah. opening up and talking about stuff and they're like oh, fuck it. it's not why, just me why do you think that is then there's a massive smoke screen out there that oh you've got the nice house you've got a nice car you've got a wife yeah. everything's lovely to, but deep down there's a lot of men out there are still little boys because they haven't dealt with the trauma maybe from a 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 year old for them to be able to move forward in life or they're actually stuck in life at the moment yeah I don't in many cases it's not some people have got trauma in many cases it's not even trauma again it just comes the What's really good and why I love what we do is when you see someone and, and I see it or someone sent me a message the other day, you know, through the different processes, techniques that we use, they're like, they have an epiphany moment yeah. and they suddenly realize why they're actually acting in a certain way. They're like, oh, fucking hell. Oh, of course, that's why I'm doing this. And once they have that, they're like, oh, okay, now I understand why I'm doing this and how I'm seeing it. I can change it. And the first thing I always say to people with this process before they come into the coaching, the only way this works is you've got to be ready to be honest with yourself yeah. unless you are going to really get, and that's the hard, this is harder in many ways than, than any other work that you do because you have to be willing to look inside and look at parts of yourself that you perhaps don't like. Yeah. And when I first went through, you know, when I really started to, to, to go through this process and really it was the work that I did myself that led into it you know I realized that I was great in a work sphere I had mm. a very growth mindset you know willing to fail and push myself mm. but actually in a relationships I had a very fixed mindset it was mm. kind of like well this is me and you know take it or leave yeah. it because I can't change as opposed to oh, actually, if I start to have difficult you know if I actually have those difficult conversations that I don't want to mm. and I put effort into working through it as uncomfortable as that feels well funnily enough i suddenly start to get better relationships yeah. but it was only through that admittance of wow well, like is that, so and this is something that i do now all the time i ask myself when something comes up is that the truth or is that a belief yeah like is so if i get you know if i'm getting frustrated by something or i'm seeing something in a certain light and it just doesn't feel right the first thing i do is step back and ask myself mm. well why why am i feeling like that and and what's the belief behind this how am i how do i think it is what is the belief of myself that's driving this and what's the truth because mm. you know the belief was oh i'm fixed this is me take it or leave it mm. i can't change but the truth was well yes you can change but in order to change you want to you've got to be willing yeah you want to yeah to say yeah i okay i'm not that good at this yeah. so i'm falling down in this i'm you know perhaps not um opening up emotionally or whatever it is but it's so when you when you do that although it's hard it's also positive because we've all got parts of ourselves mm. that you know aren't great or that we don't like but once we see that or are willing to look at it then you can start to change mm. and that and that's when people make those breakthroughs and yeah. start to really feel good again mm. do you get a buzz of people making big breakthroughs for your course yeah yeah, it's, it is when you see someone and like, you know the testimonials page that we've got now and it's the simple things it's when people talk about their kids and their partners you know one that stands out is he said you know my wife's got a husband back and my kids have got their dad yeah, back because I'm not snapping at them I'm, yeah. you know I'm not and there was another one it was actually a guy in America that I work with um, and it's we've got a little clip of it you know it was a, it was a video chat I was having with him and he said he was watching TV with his daughter and he was laughing at something and afterwards she said you know dad you were laughing and he said yeah and she said but you were really laughing she said that's the first time i've seen you happy in a long time she said you know when you were laughing before it just seemed like you were kind of forcing it yeah. but now you know i Brilliant. can see you're really happy Brilliant. and that's yeah so powerful i think and again we don't do anything i don't think we do anything special we just We've taken that mindset, we've put it into a practical steps that people can follow. Mm. And when they engage with it and they are willing to do the work, then it really opens, mm. you know, opens it up for them, mm. which is amazing. Absolutely. This is fantastic. Really, really powerful stuff. Where can people find you? Where can they find your business? Where can they find you? If there's someone out there listening now going, you know, I love what I'm hearing here. I want to get involved. I want to get in contact with Jeffers. I want to find out how much it costs, what the course is. What have I got to do to move forward? 
the easiest ways are so on social media it's the natural edge um instagram linkedin just started tiktok um so all of those all it's all nat- are the natural, natural edge, edge. Okay. always the natural edge and then same with the website the natural edge.com and if someone wants to reach out to you personally just drop a d you know just drop me a d- message i always get back to people so whatever of those platforms or an email whichever is easiest just drop me a message can anyone get your linkedin yeah so Simon Jeffries on LinkedIn. So it's Simon Jeffries on LinkedIn, yeah. yeah. So it's under my name on LinkedIn. Have Jeffers on there, would you? Yeah. Jeff, Jeffers and Dodge, LinkedIn. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Professionalism. Professionalism, yeah. yeah. Mate, I've really thoroughly enjoyed this and I really do appreciate you coming in and I, I love your honesty. I appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me on. It's yeah, been mate. a good, good chat. Yeah, mate, I've loved it. Good man. Thank you very nice much. Nice one, Jeffers. Good man. <laughs>